Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Greg Tate. Thank you, Peg. Thank you, Ben. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another hard-hitting edition of Black Rock Speaks. <laughs> A conversation now in its nearly 30th year of consternation is brought to you by the Black Rock Coalition. And uh, tonight, per Jimi Hendrix, we are going to investigate the very dotty subject of are there or are there not spaceships in these space people? <laughs> Aiding us in this endeavor, <laughs> we like to set it off. Um, are my co-panelists very uh, erudite, uh, literate, learned bunch? Uh, I think of them all as uh, very visionary practitioners of their craft and medium. We have Mr. Guillermo Brown, the most current of the band, Pegasus Rising. Come join us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you this morning. What can, can I do? What can I do to get I'm, you to say it right? Oh, just, just hit me upside the head like, you know, even that hit crazy cat or vice versa. Um, first saw this show um, and doing some vocals uh, with a number of very interesting experimental ensembles, uh, Thiefs. I said that one right now. Yeah, I said that right now. You know, and with Mr. Gordon Boyd well, and uh, most recently with his current project. He also worked on uh, several iterations of uh, the Jay Iyer and uh, Mike Ladd's project, uh, Holding It Down, uh, the Veterans uh, Dream Project, um, where he does, yeah, and still like here as well. Um, so, Mr. Guillermo Brown. Next, I'd like to bring up uh, a multi splendid partner in crime, Miss LaRonda Davis. All right. uh, yeah. Who uh, is the president of the Black Rock Coalition? Thank you. And, and who uh, is also an amazing graphic designer, executive person in her you know, civilian life on the DL, you know. Like, we just think LeBron is just super fab all the time, so we, we can't even believe she actually holds down a full-time job, too. But she does that, and she does road management for Blood Sugar and Tamar Kali and all kinds of fabulous things. And um, she describes herself here as a card-carrying member of the people should be able to nurture, express, and protect their true artistic selves club. <laughs> I took that from the Greg Tate book of having to be one in one sentence. Of hyphenation, yes. Of him dashification, yeah. yes. Uh, to that end. Okay. And she's also on the board of directors for the Willie Mae Rock Camp for Girls cause. And very much dedicated to. Um, and let's see, she occasionally lends her voice to the Creative Unity Collective on WBAI. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I won't give away your whole game. You know? um, next, I'd like to uh, bring up Kamara Thomas, <laughs> who I first saw perform as a killer, dealer, thriller bassist and vocalist with the uh, trio Earl Greyhound, which she's been a member of for about 10 years. And she is most recently uh, formed. Uh, another band known as Kamara Thomas and the Ghost Gamblers, who in 2013 released their debut album, Earth Hero. And says in 2005, Kamara returned to her roots in theater and began writing and developing musical storytelling experiences for social spaces. Her work for Bulgaria, a dark fairy tale examining rock and roll mythology, has enjoyed workshop presentations in New York at the Living Room and Galapagos Art Spaces. And, uh, there's uh, many other groovy things here that you can read about Kamara. But Kamara Thomas. <laughs> now I have the honor and privilege of bringing up the double OG of the <laughs> Mr. Garland Jeffries, um, whose work I first heard back in the 70s on a fantastic album uh, called Ghost Rider. And um, he has a 
long, estimable, esteemed career as a singer, songwriter. Um, and when I think of him, I think of, uh, of New York uh, very specifically as a place, a place that generates a very specific kind of mind and perspective and, and observation on the world, and politics and culture and multiple ethnicities and multiple uh, forms of music. Um, his most recent album is called The King of In Between. He describes it as a distillation of a long career dedicated, dedicated to addressing socially conscious themes across a broad range of musical styles. Mr. Garland Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you. So, since I knew I was going to be up here with all of these uh, very uh, sagacious folks, uh, I came up with some of the most, uh, I would say, existential and pretentious and highfalutin questions <laughs> of, uh, of my highfalutin and pretentious career. Uh, but before we get to those, I, I thought I'd just kind of cut to the chase and start with you, LaRonda. Like, and um, let's address this question, like, you know, who, what is a black rocker? And, you know, um, if we want to racially profile these people, you know, um, you know what, would we, what, would we, what would we look for? You know, I mean, where do they congregate? Who are their known associates? <laughs> yeah, you know, too many questions, man. <laughs> I lost you in that. I don't know what the second word you said, but I lost you around there. Um, I mean, black rock, and it, it's come up many times, people thinking that it's, you know, some people think it's redundancy, because some people know that rock has always been historically black, and some people are like, why do we need to say it? You know, and other people are like, well, you know, does it really exist, and what's the difference, and so on and so forth. But really, I think it's, it's, um, people who champion black musicianship in whatever form it's in, especially the ones that don't get the support that, you know, um, some others get. Like, you can turn the, the, to the radio and you'll hear an R&B channel, you'll hear a gospel channel, you'll hear a hip hop, but you'll never hear a rock channel that has a majority of black people on it, or a lot of black people on it. So it's really just creating a space where that is possible, where black folk can be, uh, you know, rambunctious and, you know, say fuck you and, you know, like have that kind of attitude where whatever we make is valid and deserves space. So, you know, black rock. Okay, hold those thoughts in mind. Rambunction and saying F you. We're going to return to those things later. There you go. Um, the first question <laughs> I'd like to ask the group, though, is, um, and, you know, this is definitely a kind of roots question uh, for all of you. Just, um, you know, when did music first make a strong impact in your lives? In church. <coughs> Talk about it. Um, it was the first space that I felt uh, the, the ambient effect of music. Um, be able to connect a particular gathered community. So whether it was a bell choir or um, singing solo, that sort of the performative ritual uh, shared community experience space is where I began to time and time again see and hear and feel the power of music to connect people. I mean, how early did you begin performing in the, in the church? I would say probably four years old, I think. Okay. And I think this, this was, was this your father's church? This would be, yeah. Yeah, and where, where was that? That, were, that was in and around New Haven. Okay. So you're a townie. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I am. Much to your sugar. <laughs> Come on. Um, wow. Is this on? Okay. Um, my first, um, my first experience with music was with this album called Point by Harry Nelson. Um, that was a great PBS animation. Oh yeah, it was. I you know I don't really like the animation. I definitely like what happened to my mind better than what they produced for the animation. But um, but there was a 
point in my childhood where that was kind of the only thing I would listen to. My mom had it on the 8-track, and I would just play it over and over and over and over again, and it kind of, it still kind of brings up this, you know, this, this just golden feeling for me that, um, you know, it, it, I can feel it kind of pulsing through every everything I'm interested in, everything I do. Um, and I was very connected to the storytelling aspect of it. The point is, uh, uh, Harry Nelson is, he's kind of, if you think of the, the song, what is the loneliest number, like that was his kind of most famous song, but he he's really this just master uh, songwriter, and he wrote this, um, this basically a children's story, um, you know, masked, masking a kind of psychedelic um, journey, hero's journey, um, you know, musical thing. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of my first. Did you, you heard the album before you saw the animated version? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the album was my, you know, so it, it you know, it's pretty psychedelic. And as a kid, you know, that's easy to access. Um, so that was my first. Transformative. Yeah. yeah.